Welcome, everybody. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy days to uh, um, sit with me as we talk about women's health. So as Angie mentioned, this is a jam-packed um, lecture. I mean, as you know, entire weekends are dedicated to discussing women's health, and I have an hour with you today. So this lecture is going to be an overview. It's going to be a quick uh, talking overview, um, but I think it'll be great um, in terms of, you know, starting to think about women's hormones, how to monitor them, how to test them, all those good things. All right, let me just deal with my technology here so I have access to everything. Let me just do this. All right, sorry, let's go back. Okay, our objectives today. So we're going to review the role of the major hormones and the pertinent metabolites in terms of women's health. We'll talk about testing and assessment strategies, discuss some of the pros and cons of oral versus transdermal hormone therapies, and then we will specifically look at PMS, perimenopause, menopause, and then PCOS and metabolic syndrome, because these are some condition-based uh, treatment you know, times in a woman's life where treatment, specific treatments uh, would be considered. And so uh, we'll be talking about those as well. So these are the major hormones we're going to be thinking about today. I'm going to touch on each one briefly, the sex hormones anyway. I'm not going to be going into any great depth about cortisol. We do devote an entire Wellness Wednesday lecture to the HPA axis um, that was given earlier this year. So it's archived on our doctor's data website if you wanted to review that information. Um, if you're interested in monitoring how hormones are moving through the steroid hormone cascade, then doing the HUMAP test will give you that information. That's our urinary metabolites profile. Today, I don't have time to focus on urinary metabolite testing. Um, so just a heads up, the August and September Wellness Wednesday webinars will be solely dedicated to discussing the HUMAP and then walking you through some cases. So please join us then if you are interested in learning more about the HUMAP. Okay, so we'll start by discussing estrogen. When we think about the action of estrogen, we're thinking about how it typically promotes growth. Uh, it's trophic. It nourishes us. There are more than 400 functions of estrogen in the body. We know that it helps to develop sex characteristics in puberty. It stimulates the growth of breast, vaginal, and endometrial tissue. Every month, it stimulates the development of the follicle. It helps to promote fat storage in certain areas of the body. It maintains collagen in the skin and connective tissue, aids in synthesis of neurotransmitters and glucose transport, specifically across the blood-brain barrier, um, helps protect and nourish neurons. Uh, it gets a bad rap sometimes, but estrogen is essential to having a healthy woman. Um, so let's talk for a second about the estrogen quotient. Uh, Dr. Henry Lemon, uh, was one of the pioneers working in integrative medicine in the 60s. And he noticed that women who developed breast cancer had significantly lower levels of estriol or E3. So he came up with this calculation called the estrogen quotient. It calculates how much estriol a woman has in comparison to the sum of estradiol and estrone, which are considered to be the more proliferative types of estrogen. Um, so essentially, it can be used as a risk assessment tool for estrogen-dependent cancers because Dr. Lemon noted that women with higher levels of estriol had less incidence of breast cancer. Uh, so there's an inversely proportional relationship between estriol and the more proliferative estrogens. Um, so uh, this can be attained, this data, if you do our Comprehensive Plus profile, which includes estrone and estriol as well as estradiol. So uh, an estrogen Estrogen quotient greater than one is associated with a lower risk. The optimal value would be something over 1.5. So when we think about using estriol, generally um, we're thinking about using it for atrophic vaginitis and vaginal dryness, but the health benefits are actually uh, much broader than that. So we just discussed the estrogen quotient. So lowering the risk for certain types of cancer um, is potentially a role for estriol. But you can also see here that um, it can be used in postmenopausal women who have been previously treated for breast cancer. It can also prevent bone loss and increase bone mineral density. Um, generally, it's not going to push any endometrial changes in postmenopausal women. It's not as strong as estradiol. Um, but again, it's really, really an excellent uh, therapy for any issues with uh, atrophic changes in 
um, the vaginal uh, tissues, the labial tissues, the tissues around the urethra, so for uh, chronic UTIs, that sort of thing. Um, it's also safe for the climacteric symptoms, the uh, vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes and night sweats. And do keep in mind that if you're applying it vaginally, it will be systemically absorbed. Um, so if you're trying to both address vaginal changes and the estrogen quotient, vaginal application will do that for you. So today is a women's health lecture, but I did want to address this common question that I get regarding the estrogen quotient in men, and that is, can you use the data that EQ gives you to apply to men? So here's the nitty gritty. The research done on the EQ has, was really only focusing on women in respect to breast changes. There's no reference range for men. Um, so... Um, you may, despite the lack of a reference range, you may decide to run it because there are some hormonal similarities between breast um, and endometrial tissue and prostate tissue. So some providers do like to have this data um, to extrapolate it to prostate health. So a quick word about um, the estrogen and the influences of estrogen that might be present in your patients. So when you test hormones with doctor's data, what you're going to see reflected there is the endogenous hormones, as well as any therapeutic ther uh, estrogen therapies that your patients are using. Phytoestrogens and xenoestrogens are not going to show up in testing. Uh, their chemical structure is different. They mimic estrogens in the body and they can increase estrogen bur burden, but they're not picked up by the testing methodology. So just a note that uh, the um, influence of estrogens may be bigger than what the test reflects. So if you have any reason to think that your patient has been exposed to xenoestrogens or is getting a lot of phytoestrogens in their diet, then you may wanna consider that the impact of estrogens might be slightly higher than what the test is indicating. In some patients, it can be helpful to assess estrogen metabolites. Uh, so the HUMAP, the Hormone Urine Urinary Metabolites Assessment Profile, is Dr. Stata's uh, metabolites test. So that's the profile you're going to want to use if you're interested in keeping an eye on estrogen breakdown, because um, this can give you insight into breast health in regards to breast cancer risk. It helps to evaluate the um, potential DNA mutagenesis, uh, evaluate the metabolism of both endogenous and exogenous hormones, evaluation of methylation potential by um, helping to monitor activity of the COMT enzyme. Uh, if your patient is not supplementing with estrogen, but estrogen levels are elevated, you might want to monitor the activity of the aromatase enzyme. And again, this is via the metabolites profile. So the aromatase enzyme, its um, technical name is CYP19A1. Uh, so this enzyme um, pushes the conversion of androstenedione to estrone and testosterone to estradiol. When we think about estrogen, um, before the menopausal transition, it's made in the ovaries, but after menopause, uh, generally it's coming from peripheral conversion from aromatase activity. So it can be helpful to keep an eye on the activity of this enzyme. And then this is a SNP from the estrogens neighborhood of the HUMAP profile. So you can see here just briefly what uh, sort of data it gives you. Um, remember that this profile is uh, color coded to match your patient's imbalances and, and blue is generally a deficiency of hormone, green is sort of the optimal range, yellow is upper range. So you can see here this patient's got um, higher levels of estrone, lower levels of the other estrogens and when we look at metabolism those methyl metabolites are a little bit lower. So you can keep an eye on that. And then also the percentage of the 2, 4, and 16 hydroxyestrones, um, which are the most well-studied in terms of um, potential for uh, DNA changes. So let's talk about that a little bit. When we look at estrogen metabolism, the first uh, stage in this breakdown, here's estrone, estradiol, estriol, and then we've got the breakdown via um, the two hydroxyestrogens driven by cytochrome uh, P1A1, and then the four hydroxyestrones driven by 1B1, and then also 16-hydroxyestrone. Uh, so um, briefly, two is considered the safest pathway, four is considered the uh, to have the most potential for DNA damage, and the 16-hydroxyestrone 
has less potential for DNA damage than the four, but it can drive growth. So in some postmenopausal women and even males, um, looking at this in terms of the potential to support bone density can be helpful. Um, so that's why you might wanna look at phase one. If um, movement down the four pathway is greater than the two pathway, that could potentially be problematic. So how can we influence this? Well, you can see here things that might have a negative influence on the enzymes as well as a positive influence. So the thing most of us are probably familiar with is using DIM to try to promote movement down the two pathway, but you can see there are a lot of other options as well. Then we talk about phase two. This is movement from the hydroxyl into the methylated form of these metabolites. Essentially, we're inactivating the catechol estrogens. Um, we want methylation because when they're methylated, they don't typically cause DNA damage or tumor growth. Um, if you've got low levels of methylated or methoxy estrogens relative to their precursors, then it might indicate a need for supporting the methylation pathway. So estrogen conjugation can happen via these five ways, methylation, glutathionization, glucuronidation, sulfation, and acetylation. Uh, with this test, we're typically looking at supporting methylation um, because you can see here, again, if detox doesn't continue from phase one through phase two, it can kind of go out another route where it's oxidized uh, via CYP peroxidase. And this can lead to the quinone metabolites, which do have the potential to initiate DNA changes and tumor growth. So if methylation is not occurring efficiently, we do wanna try to promote that, but we could also support glutathionization and glucuronidation to try to help um, blunt the impact of those changes. Um, and so again, to support that phase two or COMT, here you can see those ideas, essentially promoting methylation activity. So let's talk about types of estrogen therapy. There are a lot to choose from. Um, oral patches, transdermal creams, gels, or sprays. Uh, vaginal application can be tablets, creams, or even rings. And then compounded, generally we're talking about creams or sublinguals. I generally prefer the transdermal options, and this is one reason why. So I'll start with the um, conjugated equine estrogen. This is the trade name uh, Primarin. There's some pros here. It's pretty potent, so um, pretty good at symptom control. It's cost effective and a lot of patients are comfortable with oral routes of administration because we're all accustomed to taking pills. But the cons, I think, outweigh the pros. There's an exaggerated potency in the liver. It has a longer half-life. And so there's more estrogen subtypes and metabolites made with this type of synthetic estrogen. Uh, the different met metabolic consequences can be significant. Um, oral including CEE, so any type of oral estrogen can increase the risk of stroke because it can increase inflammation and clotting factors. Um, another con is there are less robust anxiolytic and antidepressant effects and oral estrogens can increase uh, inflammation. So HSCRP as well as triglyceride levels. Um, but I do wanna uh, emphasize here, it's not just conjugated equine estrogens. Any type of oral estrogen, even if it's bioidentical, can be problematic. Oral estrogens can increase blood pressure, increase triglycerides, increase estrone, cause gallstones, elevate liver enzymes, decrease uh, IGF-1, so IGF-1 promotes growth hormone, so essentially oral estrogens may deplete growth hormone. Um, oral estrogens can also increase C-reactive protein and inflammatory markers, all potentially very dangerous. So this is a really busy slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you the high points here. So topical hormones bypass liver metabolism, so they don't cause high concentrations in the liver like the oral forms do. Transdermal estrogen does not result in the same increase in inflammation and coagulation markers that we see with oral hormones. Both oral and transdermal estradiol will improve HDL, uh, excuse me, the HDL to LDL ratio, um, but transdermals have more of a favorable effect on triglycerides. Generally, we see less weight gain with transdermal estradiol, 
uh, and more importantly, less metabolic syndrome. And lastly, oral estrogen will increase sex hormone binding globulin, which can decrease bioavailable testosterone, which can decrease things like libido, which is already often a problem in menopause. So in general, I think avoiding oral estrogens is a good rule of thumb. This study is unusual because it examines BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, uh, on various biomarkers. So studies of this kind are actually pretty hard to find because there's not a lot of research money invested in BHRT. I think because there's no real money to be made from these hormones, my understanding is that they're not patentable. Um, so that might be the issue. But you can see that this study found good response in terms of symptom management. But perhaps more importantly, cardiovascular biomarkers, inflammatory factors, immune signaling factors, and health outcomes were favorably impacted despite very high life stress and home and work strain in study subjects. Uh, this is taken from that study. And you can see here that for all of these biomarkers, we've got um, you know, things like triglycerides, fasting, glucose, but a lot of clotting factors and a lot of infl inflammatory factors. The amount of unfavorable that we see with uh, regular HRT, typically oral, versus the amount of favorable factors we see with compounded BHRT, which is transdermal, is significant. So the author's conclusion was that compound transdermal BHRT may be considered an important therapeutic op option in peri- and postmenopausal women due to its net beneficial effect on hemostatic and inflammatory markers, cardiovascular biomarkers, quality of life measures, and health outcomes. So what about tamoxifen? Um, I just wanted to talk about it for a second because we get this question a lot. How does tamoxifen affect hormone testing? Well, it doesn't because tamoxifen attaches to hormone receptors in the cancer cell. So it actually blocks estrogen from attaching to the receptors, which can slow or stop the growth of the tumor by preventing the cancer cell from getting the hormone that it needs to grow. Um, but that doesn't affect the amount of estrogen that is being secreted. So essentially, um, estrogen levels during tamox tamoxifen therapy may have limited importance. So you might test your patient and see high estrogen or low estrogen, but it doesn't really matter if they're on tamoxifen therapy because tamoxifen is gonna block the impact of that hormone for that woman. Now the other hormones are probably worth testing and getting information on, but with estrogen and tamoxifen, um, this is the case. Okay, we'll move on to progesterone now. So with estrogen, we thought about it promoting growth. When we think of progesterone, we think about it um, influencing differentiation. It balances estradiol. So generally when we think about progesterone production, in uh, cycling women, it's made in the corpus luteum during the second half of the menstrual cycle, but small amounts are also produced by the adrenal gland. So the functions of progesterone are many. It opposes the effects of that estrogen, of estrogen's growth in tissues like the brain, the breast, and the endometrium. It helps to help it, that the differentiation we're talking about means that those cells are becoming what they were meant to be. It's not unbridled growth. Progesterone helps to modulate that. Um, and if it's given uh, orally, it can help with sleep. It can enhance thyroid hormone activity by decreasing thyroid binding globulin. Um, so just to name a few. One of the, uh, the most exciting ones, I think, is that it can promote cell differentiation as well as cell death. So that's what we think about in terms of uh, growth, cancer growth. Uh, so let's talk about this term estrogen dominance. I'm sure you've heard it before. What it basically means is that progesterone levels are not um, present in amounts that are enough to balance the influence of the estradiol. So really, the better term might be progesterone insufficiency. But this term was popularized by the late John Lee, MD, and he began to understand through his work with women, especially those who had cancer who weren't candidates for estrogen therapies, that progesterone-treated tissues um, could address osteoporosis and uh, help with the um, uh, other symptoms, even in women who had cancer. 
So I just wanted to point out to you just again to remember, it doesn't mean too much estrogen. So this example of estrogen dominance, in fact, does mean that. So we're looking at estradiol, progesterone, and then this ratio, we're, we're just dividing progesterone by estradiol. Um, but this patient would also be considered estrogen dominant. In this case, estrogen is not elevated, but in its relationship to progesterone, there's still not enough progesterone to bring balance to that. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about estrogen dominance. Really, it should be progesterone insufficiency. And this can happen in women of any age. In premenopause, it's generally driven by a lack of ovulation or a luteal phase deficiency. So this can be due to a woman who has a lot of stress or a poor diet. It can also be caused by birth control pill usage. Uh, in perimenopause, it's the erratic cycles that start to cause estrogen dominance. Generally, these women are not ovulating every month, and if you don't ovulate, you don't make progesterone. And in postmenopause, we're looking at the decline in progesterone that's pretty steep because we're no longer ovulating. And then of course, if women are on estrogen only hormone replacement therapy, um, that one's pretty obvious. So I alluded to oral contraceptives. Generally, these contain estradiol and a progestin. Um, so the mechanism of action is that the estradiol and the progestin in these pills influence the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis by affecting its negative feedback loop. So essentially, it um, causes a decrease in FSH and LH secretion, and that results in anovulation and potentially even low testosterone because the oral estrogen increases sex hormone binding globulin, which binds up testosterone and can low lower those levels. So the anovulation results in decreased progesterone for sure, sometimes estradiol levels because that corpus luteum is not fully fo formed, and the result is progesterone insufficiency, aka estrogen dominance. These are some of the signs and symptoms. Um, this is often why women come in to see us, right? They've got a lot of anxiety. Maybe they're bloated. Maybe they're gaining weight. They have a decreased libido. They've got breast tenderness. They've got irregular periods. They're irritable. They have mood swings, et cetera, et cetera. This is often, I think, what drives women to come in for care from me. So it's always something that I want to check on. So I think it's really alarming how many scientific articles confuse progestins and progesterone. They talk about them as if they share the same physiological effects, but they don't. And so I wanted to make sure we talked about this today. They are not the same. So you can see here molecularly, this is progesterone and this is progestin. In this case, medroxyprogesterone acetate, acetate MPA or Provera. So it's similar enough that they're able to attach to progesterone receptors, but the progestins actually can have a lot of negative side effects and they don't always have the same biological helpful effects as bioidentical progesterone will. So essentially the, the thing that progestins are most helpful with is that they will provide endometrial protection. Um, but you can see here that the differences are pretty great. So progesterone promotes pregnancy. In fact, that's where it gets its name, progestation, progesterone. Progestins prevent pregnancy. Progesterone is protective to the breast and can reduce the risk of cancer. Progestins have been shown to increase the risk of breast cancer. Progesterone is really nourishing to the nervous system, uh, whereas progestins can increase the risk of things like Alzheimer's, by a lot. Progesterone benefits the heart. Progestins increase the risk of heart attack. It can also increase the risk of mood disorders. Um, so in general, progestins should be avoided at least orally. Um, this was a study, a French study that compared progesterone to a progestin. Um, and they found that um, Women who were using estrogen plus a progestin compared to women who were using estrogen plus a progesterone found significant differences. There was an increase in the incidence of breast cancer with the progestin group, but not in the progesterone group. Now here's the Chang study. It's now considered an older study. It's from 1995, but it's one of the most famous studies on the answer anti-cancer benefits of progesterone. 
So they had 40 premenopausal women who were scheduled for excisional biopsy of some benign lesions, and they were giving topical progesterone, topical estradiol, or both for 10 to 13 days prior to surgery. And there was a reduction in the proliferation rate, uh, excuse me, proliferation rate of the acenar cells in both the estrogen uh, and the combination groups. But you can see here the progesterone only group um, had the, the biggest decrease um, in uh, tissue growth. Um, and so, and, and that what's interesting here is that the progesterone was radio labeled. And so it was able to be seen that it had been taken up by the breast tissue and it was seen in the biopsy, but it was not seen in the serum. And, and this is something we talk about in the January Wellness Wednesday lecture about the differences between saliva and serum and tissue levels. But um, we can often see changes in tissues that may not show up in serum. So that was another take home from the Chang study. So when we talk about giving progesterone, um, I did want to touch on the differences between oral and topical progesterone. So when we give progesterone orally, it's quickly and thoroughly metabolized on its first pass through the liver, so much so that very little unadulterated progesterone is actually making it to the tissues. And we're, again, with women, we're often thinking about breast and uterine tissues in particular. Um, oral progesterone is largely converted to allopregnenolone. So this can attach to GABA receptors, which can be really helpful therapeutically if we're trying to address anxiety or insomnia. But if you're trying to get progesterone to the tissues, it may not be the best way to do it. In that case, transdermal progesterone is better. So you can see here, if we're applying progesterone to the skin, it's very quickly absorbed into all of these capillaries here and subdermal and subdermal capillaries and it quickly moves to tissues all over the body and then only after that makes its way to the liver. Um, so that's the best way to get progesterone to the tissues. And here, uh, pearl, you can give both at the same time. Um, so the benefit to this would be to have the tissue protection of the transdermal progesterone and then the anxiolytic effects of the oral progesterone. So this is a uh, Humap SNPs, and I just wanted to show you this is the same patient before and after oral progesterone supplementation. So uh, here the progesterone level was within the reference interval, but um, and in postmenopausal women that will always be true because there's no bottom of the range. But you can see here the metabolites, the 5 alpha and 5 beta pregnenolone and the allopregnenolone are low, but after taking an oral progesterone, you can see that this value comes up quite a bit. So it's kind of exciting that we can monitor that via the urinary metabolites. Uh, and there, here's some references uh, if you want to dive further into progesterones. All right, so now we're going to move into androgen. So this uh, means that we're going to be talking about DHEA and testosterone. Generally, when we think about androgens, we're thinking about vitality. Testosterone is secreted by the adrenal glands and the ovaries. It does decrease as we age. Also, if uh, your woman, your woman, your female patient has been given a hysterectomy with or without an oophorectomy, but certainly with an oophorectomy. And then also with uh, anyone taking oral estrogen. So remember, oral estrogen increases sex hormone binding globulin, which has a strong affinity for testosterone and it binds it up. So lower SHBG can result in higher levels of testosterone. We will often, though, see testosterone be elevated in women who have established or evolving insulin resistance, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a second. So uh, we know that testosterone is imperative for men, but it's just as important to a woman's stamina and health. You can see here all the things it can improve, brain function, memory, sleep, sense of well-being, motivation, vitality, essential for libido and arousal and orgasm, great for the tissues because it's anabolic, so it can improve bone density, maintain muscle mass, and even help burn fat. We think about DHEA, it's also considered to be an androgen, but it's secreted by the adrenal glands. It's also a pro-hormone because DHEA can convert to both testosterone and estradiol. So like testosterone, DHEA can decrease with age, but it can be elevated in women again, in the presence of evolving or established insulin resistance. DHEA is important for libido and arousal, sense of motivation and well-being. It can improve immune function, improve sleep, improve memory. Um, after menopause, a lot of the estrogen we make 
we make comes from, we said aromatase in the previous section, that's true, but also from conversion from DHEA. DHEA is the active form, DHEAS is the storage form. So if you're measuring in saliva, you're gonna see DHEA, not the storage form. DHEAS is considered the inactive polar form. Uh, it's not visible in the saliva testing that doctor's data does. Um, so they're not the same thing. But if you do want to consider the storage form in addition to the active form, both are measured in the urinary metabolites profile. So if androgens are deficient, your patients will likely feel blunted motivation, some body aches, maybe a decrease in mental clarity, decreased libido, decreased muscle mass and stamina. These people often feel depressed. You could see incontinence because the tissues of the pelvic floor and the vaginal tissues around the urethra can become lax. Um, so you, I'm not gonna read all these. You can see uh, what these are. But then if people have too much androgen, um, they may come in with acne, loss of scalp hair. So this is a sort of a male pattern baldness that we see in females. Hirsutism, so they're losing hair on the head, but they're sprouting it on the face. They're in places in the body that it shouldn't be. Uh, increased risk of PCOS, but also depression and disturbed sleep. An increased risk of some pathologies like uh, breast cancer, heart disease, and metabolic syndrome. It can affect triglycerides, abdominal fat, et cetera. Um, another important note, low testosterone can affect libido, but so can high testosterone. So there's, as is often the case, there's sort of a good middle ground that we're going for. So a question we often get is, what is the optimal level of testosterone in perimenopausal women? There's really no optimal, but you can see the range is six to 49. So generally sort of the middle of that range is, is what you're shooting for where women will often feel best. Uh, and then looking at androgen metabolism uh, in women can be really helpful. This allows us to dive a little deeper, especially if there's a PCOS or metabolic syndrome at play, because so we can keep an eye on testosterone, it's a primary metabolite, DHT, which is here. We can look at the activity of the aromatase enzyme and also the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, again, which sort of helps to drive testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. All right, let's talk about testing in a general way. So with salivary hormone testing, I, recommend, I typically recommend the comprehensive panel for a baseline test. So this includes estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and four timed cortisols, or a diurnal cortisol profile. The adrenals are really important in affecting hormone levels and in women's health in general, so I don't recommend leaving those out. Um, saliva testing is recommended for baseline as well as monitoring any type of hormone therapy. Um, Saliva is what you want to use when you're monitoring response to therapy, especially if it's transdermal or uh, sublingual, because those generally don't show up well and in other mediums. But it's the best way to monitor tissue levels, and that's what saliva does. The HUMAP, the liquid urine hormone metabolites profile, can be a great addition to salivary levels. It helps you assess the metabolism of both endogenous and exogenous hormones, where you can assess the various risks because you're looking at phase one and phase two detox and that sort of thing. So timing in premenopausal women who are cycling, you're gonna try to catch that luteal surge in a 28 day cycle. You're gonna go uh, for uh, getting a sample between days 19 and 23. In perimenopause, you wanna try to do the same, but because periods can become pretty erratic in perimenopause, you gotta do the best you can. The truth is um, in those perimenopausal years, women are not always ovulating every cycle. So there may not be a luteal phase to catch. So you do your best. And then after menopause, any day is fine because we no longer have a luteal surge. Um, but just a reminder of what the luteal surge is, this is the time in the menstrual cycle when progesterone should be at its peak for the month and estrogen should be at the height of its luteal plateau. So if we test mid luteal phase, we can get a lot of information. Um, we can see if both estrogen and progesterone are within the range. If they are, then we can safely say that ovulation has occurred. If progesterone levels are lower than expected, but estrogen is within range or low, it can be assumed that ovulation did not occur. And it also allows us to assess for luteal phase deficiency. So maybe ovulation occurred, but the progesterone levels are not as high as they might be. And also for estrogen dominance or progesterone insufficiency as maybe we should call it. 
So here's some guidelines for collection when cycles are not 28 days. Um, you can follow these guidelines to try to catch the luteal surge. This is available on our website. Uh, it's the best practices for um, sample collection. Uh, so keep it on hand to discuss with your patients who have a regular cycle. So remember that if the patient ovulated, they have a luteal phase and the luteal phase is always 14 days plus or minus two because the corpus luteum has a finite lifespan. So that's why if cycles are longer or shorter in a woman who's ovulating, it's the follicular phase that varies, not the luteal phase. And so we have these rules for trying to catch it. And these rules are the same, whether you're testing in saliva or urine or serum. So especially in menopause, some providers don't see the utility of testing women um, because the assumption is that when ovulation stops, we can predict the imbalances that exist. But I wanted to show you this slide because I think it's important to uh, remind you of the clinical challenge we can face when we're treating women who have the same symptoms. So all of these women had roughly the same symptoms. They, the severity differed, um, but these are three menopausal women who came in with roughly the same symptom picture. But you can see when we tested them, we found very different imbalances. Patient three had what you might consider to be a stereotypical menopausal imbalance, right? The estradiol was low. The ratio between estradiol and progesterone was low. But patient one and patient two had elevated estrogens, both estradiol and estriol. So testing really can help you target your treatments, which as functional medicine providers, you know, we like to do. So here's a very brief summary of why you might want to run a HUMAP to monitor various urinary metabolites. So as far as estrogen metabolism goes, you can get information about carcinogenic potential, about methylation and COMT enzyme activity, and you can look for evidence of phase one and phase two detox via the movement of the estrogen metabolites. For androgens, you can get a deeper evaluation of PCOS and metabolic syndrome because it's going to give you that enzyme activity for aromatase and 5-alpha reductase. Cortisol metabolites can give us information regarding obesity, metabolic syndrome, and inflama uh, inflammation. Um, it can be helpful also to look at the amounts of cortisol versus cortisone, which is the storage form. And as far as progesterone goes, there's a very, very small amount of progesterone actually found in the urine. Um, but we can measure it directly at doctor's data. And so we can look at progesterone as well as metabolites. And as we already saw, allopregnenolone, um, that anxiolytic metabolite can be a, a helpful thing to monitor. Uh, and here is the summary page of the HEMA. You might also consider neurotransmitter testing, especially when you have done a really good job of balancing the hormones, but the patient still has symptoms that are persisting. So this is often a good next step. Um, it's also a great option when the patient is utilizing hormonal birth control without any intent to discontinue it because that's going to affect your ability to monitor sex hormones and even cortisol, especially if it's an oral contraceptive because um, you see an increase in SHBG and an increase in uh, corticoid binding uh, globulin or cortisol binding globulin. And then of course, also if severe mood concerns are present, neurotransmitters are helpful. And then in terms of serum, you know, keep an eye on the thyroid, monitor the CBC and CMP, iron levels, vitamin D levels and lipids, you know, all the regular stuff. Okay, now we're gonna go into some of the specifics. In cycling women, the, the thing we hear about often is PMS. Uh, it was classified in 1981, it's got an ICD-10 code. So it affects menstruating women of any age. So really young girls, right? As young as eight or nine, if they've started menstruating and it goes until we stop menstruating. So maybe age 55 is kind of considered the top end of um, when menopause occurs. The stats say up to 80% of women of reproductive age do report some unpleasant physical and psychological symptoms before their period. So by definition, PMS is the cyclic occurrence of symptoms that are of sufficient severity to interfere with some aspects of life and appear with consistent and predictable relationships to menses. So essentially, they'll get a month after month. The etiology is usually considered to be estrogen dominance, but adrenal dysfunction, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and blood sugar dysregulation is probably also at work. Um, 
we can modulate progesterone by trying to help these women ovulate um, every month and have a robust progesterone secretion. Um, or you can choose to supplement with uh, bioidentical progesterone itself. So it really depends on the patient and her conception goals. Um, so conventionally, generally, these women are given oral contraceptives and psychotropics to try to manage the mood aspects of PMS. So as integrative providers, again, what we can do is try to promote ovulation, work on lifestyle, potentially turn to bioidentical hormone therapy, as well as nutraceuticals and neurotransmitter balancing. So I have a naturopathic medical school here in Portland. So I'm lucky enough to live near an herbal medicinary. Um, so I, this, this is a, an herbal formulation that was given to me when I was a medical student. Um, but there's some companies out there that make herbal formulations that are very similar to these. So essentially the idea is the formula one that's used for the first two weeks of the month is more of an estrogenic. Uh, formulation and formula two is more progesterinic. And so if you're alternating them, it's helping to promote ovulation, which then promotes um, the patient's own progesterone. You'll see these come up again and again. With all of these issues, we want to try to optimize the diet, get patients moving, help them with stress and weight management as well. So some non-hormonal forms of nutrient support for PMS are listed here. Um, and a few that sort of come to the top of the list, B6 is one. It combats the symptoms of excess estrogen. It can function as a cofactor in the creation of serotonin and dopamine. And it also seems to improve progesterone concentrations, interestingly. Um, serotonin, dopamine, and progesterone are all thought to be low in women with PMS, and so that's why vitamin B6 can be really beneficial. So there were trials that looked at 40 to 500 milligrams a day as being effective in reducing the symptoms of PMS, and this was things like edema, bloating, headache, breast pain, depression, irritability, and even acne. Another top performer in PMS management is calcium. Um, note that the higher doses, 1,000 to 1,200, uh, did improve PMS symptoms, but lower doses were not shown to be effective. So uh, make sure that you are giving high enough doses of calcium to uh, help these women. Um, this study looked at aerobic exercise and strength training and found that both groups showed symptom improvement. The aerobic group improved a little bit more, especially with depression, but both uh, showed improvement. So what I take away from this is that we really don't want to split hairs. Any type of exercise is going to improve our patient's symptoms. If I have a patient that wants the Im most impactful method specifically for PMS, I might recommend aerobic exercise, but the exercise program that works for your patient, the one that she'll actually follow, that's the one you want to recommend. The relationship between hormones and neurotransmitters can influence the severity of symptoms experienced by these women. And so any time you test neurotransmitters and find suboptimal levels, that's going to influence mood, drive, sleep, and emotions. So if we want to try to balance estrogen with supplemental progesterone in these women, uh, remember that we have to keep in mind conception goals. So for women who are interested in conception, you just want to give progesterone after ovulation. So that's the luteal phase. So if we're looking at a 28-day cycle, it would be days 15 to 28. If she's not interested in conception, you can essentially just take the week off for menses. And this is because if progesterone is really working to manage symptoms, she may not want to stop it for that third week. And so if she's not currently trying to conceive, just using it when she's not menstruating is acceptable. And in perimenopause, generally, I mean, it's not always true, but generally at this point, women are no longer actively trying to conceive. And so if that's the case, the three weeks on, one week off is a good option. So when I give progesterone, I usually base my transdermal doses on weight, if women are 150 pounds or less, I'm looking at 20 to 30 milligrams a day. And if she's over 150, I might double it. And if she has a lot of vasomotor symptoms, I might give half the amount twice a day. So I wanted to briefly talk about PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. This is a more severe form of PMS where patients have very severe irritability, depression, and anxiety. 
um, often in the week or even two weeks before the period starts. Generally, these symptoms will go away a few days after bleeding has um, has happened. It can affect up to 10% of menstruating women. Uh, it seems to also be associated with estrogen dominance and progesterone insufficiency. And remember that hormone changes can cause a serotonin deficiency. So how do you diagnose it? Well, over the course of a year, during most of the menstrual cycles, five or more of the following should be present. Depression, anger, irritability, trouble concentrating, lack of interest uh, in activities that she once enjoyed, moodiness, increased appetite, insomnia or hypersomnia, feeling overwhelmed, burned out, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the physical symptoms are there. Essentially, if these symptoms are severe enough that they're disturbing a woman's ability to function in her social life, in her work life, or in other situations, it could be a PMDD diagnosis. So conventionally, this is managed with birth control pills and antidepressants or anti-anxiety meds. We might choose hormone balancing, neurotransmitter support, the same dietary lifestyle things that we would consider with PMS, and then potentially psychotherapy. So a note about allopregnenolone, there's some conflicting studies out there. Some people show, excuse me, some studies have shown that symptoms get worse with allopregnenolone, some that it gets better. So this would be using oral estrogen, excuse me, oral progesterone to promote allopregnenolone. So it seems that, again, there's sort of this happy zone between too little and too much. So you could try oral progesterone with these patients, keeping in mind that if the dosage is too high, it could potentially make her symptoms worse. So you want to do a part Q with her before starting that. Okay, let's talk about conditions associated with elevated androgens. So waist size is something that's really important to consider. Generally, it's gonna be an issue if the waist is 40 uh, inches or more in men and 35 or more in women. Um, there was a survey of men and women uh, in 2016 that found that the average waist size in America is 40.3 inches for men and 38.7 for women. So this is gonna be something that is commonly seen in your office. So when we think about belly fat, there's two types to consider and they really have different metabolic actions in the body. So the first is subcutaneous fat. So this is that fat that's found just below the skin here in the hypodermis. This type of fat is not related to these classic obesity related pathologies that we think about, heart disease, cancer, and even stroke. Some studies even suggest it could be protective, at least in comparison to what we see with visceral fat. So visceral fat is all this fat that's packed around the organs here. Um, this is the dangerous fat. It is directly associated with an increase in health risks. We think about diabetes, insulin resistance, a lot of inflammatory and obesity related diseases. So why is that? One theory is the uh, portal vein hypothesis. So uh, this really states that that visceral fat is secreting free fatty acids that are very quickly absorbed into the bloodstream. And um, when you've got a lot of elevation in these free fatty acids, the skeletal muscle can't efficiently take up glucose and that can propel hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So if you wanna to try to diagnose this, um, you can see here, uh, these would be the guidelines um, for insulin resistance. If your fasting glucose is over 99, the insulin is over 20, hemoglobin A1C over 6.5, and if you did a two hour uh, insulin glucose tolerance test, it'd be over 27. So that would be more of a definitive diagnosis, but I like to keep an eye on things before we get that far. And so you might think about developing this issue if fasting glucose is over 90, insulin is over nine, et cetera, et cetera. And remember that we can start to see elevations in salivary levels of testosterone and DHEA in women before we can sometimes see these overt changes in the blood work. So that can be sort of an early red flag. There's a lot of overlap between insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and PCOS. So when we talk about PCOS, um, if these women, once they move into menopause, that PCOS is then typically called metabolic syndrome because the underlying factors seem to be metabolic. And so let's talk about that quickly. Metabolic syndrome is defined as having central obesity and then two of the remaining risk factors that occur together 
in an individual which increases her risk for coronary artery, artery disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. It's estimated that about a quarter of adults in the world and over a third of adults in the United States fit this definition. There are slight differences for their waist circumference criteria in other countries like China, Japan, South and Central America, et cetera. So pay attention to that. Um, and also uh, for the blood pressure one, if your patient's blood pressure is in the normal range, but they're taking medication to achieve that, that still counts as one of these risk factors that they have. In postmenopausal women, there's a strong association between insulin resistance and androgen excess. Quick, quick note here, in men, we see the opposite. In men with insulin resistance, androgens are reduced. They have low testosterone. So if you want a refresher on that, you can go back to the men's health lecture. But in postmenopausal women with metabolic syndrome, uh, the androgens are not made by the ovaries. They're being made somewhere else. Where is that? Um, seems to be because of the differences in um, the binding capacity of albumin and sex hormone binding globulin. So in healthy women, about 66% of the total testosterone is bound to SHBG and 30% to albumin. Only up to 2% of the testosterone is free and considered to be biologically active. But if we've got hyperinsulinemia, it's gonna reduce the SHBG concentrations, which leads to an increase in free testosterone. So this chart sort of tries to show how hyperinsulinemia, hyperandrogenemia, and insulin resistance are all interconnected and influence one another. So elevated insulin levels in the blood can lead to a decrease in sex hormone binding globulin production by the liver, a direct increase in ovarian production of testosterone, an indirect increase in ovarian production of testosterone because of disordered release of FSH and LH, and also binding receptors in the adrenal cortex. The zona reticularis will stimulate production of DHEA, and DHEA is a pro-hormone which can increase testosterone. So all of these things can contribute to upper range or elevated testosterone and DHEA levels. So you can see here, Therapeutically, what we can do is try to interrupt these processes by focusing on diet and activity. So in younger women, when they have irregular periods and reduced fertility or infertility, this metabolic syndrome is gonna be called polycystic ovarian syndrome. So to diagnose PCOS, according to the Rotterdam criteria, you need two of the following three oligoovulation or anovulation, the presence of polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, or the presence of clinical and or biochemical hyperandrogenemia. So this means elevated testosterone and um, or DHEA. Now, two things to note. You don't have to have polycystic ovaries to get this diagnosis. And also, insulin resistance and impaired sugar utilization is not one of the diagnostic criteria, but I think it probably should be. So as I discussed, saliva testing of sex hormones can suggest insulin resistance significantly earlier than serum testing does. Elevated androgens will often precede other signs of metabolic syndrome. So conventionally, this is addressed with oral contraceptives and spironolactone because those can help to manage the hirsutism and acne that these young women uh, often have. Metformin is used to control uh, blood sugar. It doesn't necessarily change the cycle of metabolic syndrome, but it addresses that one piece. Clomiphen can be used to um, uh, help with the maturation and uh, release of eggs. And then if they are ovulating, these young women will sometimes be given progesterone to try to help um, a fertilized ovum implant and uh, do that successfully. And then when, when necessary, uh, ovarian cysts can be drained surgically. Um, if we think broader than that, a little bit more functionally, what we typically wanna focus on is how do we address the underlying issues of insulin resistance? How do we stabilize blood sugar so that we can start to help those androgens come down, right? We all know how to do that. Lifestyle, dietary modifications, exercise, using botanical medicines, supplements like vitamin D, cinnamon, et cetera. We want to encourage weight loss. We want to get people exercising. Really, really important. This is a 
really good study that focused on anti-diabetic drugs and uh, lifestyle changes. So there were three groups, the metformin group, the exercise group, and then the usual care. And after three years, the reduction in proje- uh, progression to diabetes was 58% in the lifestyle group and 31% in the drug group. Pretty significant. Now, uh, there's not ever one diet that works for everyone when managing insulin resistance, but these are the general rules you want to follow. High fiber, usually 30 to 40 percent um, lean protein, and avoiding starchy carbs. That's a good place to start. I find that teaching my patients about the glycemic index of foods and learning, helping them pay attention to that can be really helpful. There's some great charts online. They can print one out and keep it on the fridge. Um, this helps insulin resistance, glucose regulation, and truncal obesity. Um, if we can you know, help the sugar uh, metabolism be, glucose metabolism be healthier. Green foods uh, and other veggies can help increase satiety and help stabilize blood sugar because they have a low glycemic index. And remember those artificial sweeteners, they can actually also lead to um, glucose dysregulation. So the diet sodas are not necessarily the best option. Inositol uh, is a great uh, therapeutic consideration because it's part of a phos- uh, let me get this right a phos- phosphoglycan uh, involved in post receptor mediated signaling pathways and this is the same pathway that's often abnormal in PCOS. So some studies here uh, one showed that supplementation with dechiro inositol was shown to decrease serum testosterone and improve ovulation, and they were using about 1,200 milligrams a day. And then in a different study, they were using two grams of myo-inositol twice a day, and that was shown to decrease insulin resistance, lower serum testosterone, improve menstrual irregularities, and improve ovulation. So I'm going to go through some treatment ideas here. Your patient doesn't need to be on every single one of these. These charts are provided to use just to give you multiple options. Um, Cinnamon and chromium can be a good place to start, along with vitamin D. If they'll only take one thing, vitamin D might be it, assuming they're deficient. I live in the Pacific Northwest where almost everyone is deficient because we have such cloudy skies, but even in places that have a lot of sunshine, if your patients aren't going outside and getting the appropriate amount of sunshine to promote vitamin D uh, secretion, they may be vitamin D deficient. So vitamin D levels are important to consider if your patient is dealing with insulin resistance. As many as 87% of women with PCOS have been found to be deficient in vitamin D. Um, One interesting clinical trial looked at improvements in insulin sensitivity compared Uh, compared to patients who were taking vitamin D compared to metformin. After 30 days, the women using vitamin D improved 21%, while the metformin was only a 13% improvement. So based on these last two slides, if we can get people moving and get them on vitamin D, uh, we might see great improvement in their insulin resistance um, picture. So, uh, So here's some other uh, potential therapeutic options for insulin resistance. And here we've got some for the dyslipidemia piece um, that we can often see with these uh, syndromes. And then we discussed these earlier, but in PCOS, patients who are interested in conception, these alternating herbal formulas can help to promote ovulation. We want to optimize the progesterone to estradiol ratio, but if you have a patient who doesn't want to use BHRT, here's some ideas. To decrease estradiol, if it has been found to be elevated on testing, you can consider, again, that whole food diet, good fiber, exercise, specifically resistance training. Get them to sleep. Nobody loses weight if they're not sleeping. And this can lower insulin resistance, which moves testosterone to estradiol via aromatization and can decrease visceral fat, which increases estradiols. All this interconnected. And then for progesterone, it can increase ovulation and support the HPA axis. You can turn to botanical support, essential fatty acids, stress management, some vitamins and minerals and botanicals. So over here on the right, is a formulation that I'll sometimes use to promote ovulation in PCOS patients. I just wanted to show you uh, what some of these formulations might look like. Uh, So this is Joy, a 25-year-old patient of mine. She came in for acne and excess facial hair growth. You can see her profile here is suggestive of PCOS. We see the elevated androgens, the upper range testosterone, the top of the range is 49, she's 48. 
the elevated DHEA. She's not ovulating, right? No estradiol, no progesterone. So um, this is a PCOS and this is a problem. So what did we do here? She was eating that standard American diet. So we started, um, I, I recommended that she start to add vegetables and protein with these carbs. Ideally, they'd probably remove them, uh, you know, at least most of the time, but you wanna start with doing something that people uh, can manage. Um, evening primrose oil was an option here, vitamin D, and we gave some of these um, vitamins and minerals to support the progesterone pathway. Um, when it comes to sleep, we wanna at least recommend that people turn off their electronics by nine and try to get to bed uh, by 9, 30, 10. Um, if they can't turn them off, blue light blockers, uh, nighttime lenses, all those sorts of things can help. Um, additionally, getting at least two hours of good sun in the daytime can sometimes help to mitigate the effects of blue light at night. But whatever your strategy, we wanna to try to get people sleeping. And then in this case, um, the exercise was resistance training, 30 minutes, two times a week, and then she did yoga one day a week. Uh, and you can see there were some incredible changes here. Enjoy after eight months. So when we talk about PCOS, this is an example of an actual patient who had PCOS. So you can see uh, the DHEA was upper range, testosterone was elevated, and some of these metabolites also on the high side. So this is a, a common finding. And here are the 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone, the, the DHT, that metabolite that can be the most problematic, um, actually wasn't elevated. So interesting, um, but these other things were. So again, you know, when we think about the HUMAP, it, we can get a lot of information, but if we're dealing with PCOS and metabolic syndrome, one of the uh, enzymes that can be important to pay attention to here is 5-alpha reductase. And again, that's because this DHT has two or three times the affinity for androgen receptors than testosterone does. And so this is often what can lead to those, those symptoms, the acne, the hair loss, the hirsutism, the abdominal weight gain, and the mood issues. It doesn't have to be elevated, but if it is, that's often the issue. And so here's some therapeutic options for addressing 5-alpha reductase. All right, I'm just sort of tacking this slide here to the end of this section because this article was just published a couple of weeks ago and I wanted to include it. Um, so the study states that prediabetes and fracture risk among midlife women in the study of women's health across the nation, that's the title, so it was a cohort of about 1,700 women without diabetes from the study of women's health across the nation cohort uh, relative to not having prediabetes at any visit before the menopausal transition. Having diabetes at every pre-menopausal trans, uh, transition visit was associated with a statistically significant 120% greater hazard for fracture during the transition and menopause. So this association was independent of the bone mineral density at the start of the transition. So what this study suggests is that for women in their midlife, if they have prediabetes, it may be a risk factor for future fractures. And of course, fractures in the elderly can lead to a whole host of comorbidities. So I did just wanna mention that it's not just the metabolic things that we typically think of, we could also be influencing bone mineral density. Okay, let's move on now to perimenopause and menopause. So when we talk about perimenopause, this is not a switch that turns off or on. This can last for many, many years. The estimates are six to 13, and then give or take more than that. This is just a time when cycles become very erratic. It can also be a time of emotional transition. These women are often report feeling very affected by stress. They're very affected by diet and lifestyle changes but it can look different for everybody. Now of note, FSH can tell us something about fertility, but I don't find it to be a reliable indicator of menopause. So we're going through this period where periods become less common. So you might go many, many, many months without a period, but it's not until at least 12 consecutive months without a period that a woman is considered to be in menopause. So that's the definition. No menstrual period for 12 consecutive months. If a woman 
doesn't have a menstrual period for 11 months, but then she has one, she's not menopausal. It's estimated that over a billion women will be postmenopausal by 2030. And the thing about perimenopause and menopause is that every woman who talks to you is going to have a different symptom picture. She's going to be experiencing that transition differently. And that's what I love about the type of medicine we all practice is that we can individualize our therapies for these women. Now, how women view the menopausal transition can actually really have an impact on how they experiencing it, how they experience it and how um, negative of an effect it'll have on their uh, physical symptoms and mental symptoms. So most of the time, women don't consider menopause to be a time of health complaints. Um, they consider it to be a normal developmental phase. Over half of the women in menopause uh, said that they were happier and more fulfilled than they had been in earlier decades of life. And over three quarters of women say they, at this point, are making some sort of significant lifestyle change in this period. And like I said, women who have negative ad uh, attitudes about menopause often report more negative symptoms. And these are the types of symptoms they might complain of. So physically, we're familiar with these, the hot flashes, the night sweats, the heart palpitations, the dyspareunia, vaginal changes, increased risk for things like UTIs and headaches and migraines. And then mentally, these women might feel exhausted, irritable, moody, depressed. They can't sleep and the brain fog can just be debilitating. And this transition into menopause can have real world implications for a lot of women. So this, uh, story was published in the New York Times on May 1st of this year, and it's based on a Mayo Clinic paper that was published in April of this year. Um, so it's talking about how uh, menopause is, seems to cost American women an estimated $1.8 billion in lost working time last year. It's the largest study of its kind that's been done in, this state, in the States. And so they looked at um, over 4,000 participants Roughly 15% said that they had either missed work or cut back on hours because of their menopause symptoms. Those who reported the worst symptoms were 16 times more likely to report such outcomes than those with the least severe symptoms. And a little over 1% said that their symptoms had become so debilitating that they either quit their jobs or were laid off in the preceding six months. So the symptoms they were talking about were migraines, brain fog, a lot of mood swings, and hot flashes. Um, the, one of the, the authors of this study, uh, the Mayo Clinic study, said this. The topic of menopause is taboo in general, but even more so in the workplace. I've heard from women that they don't want to come across as a complainer at work, or they'll bring up menopause and people will roll their eyes. And so the fact that these women feel very uncomfortable talking about what is a very natural process for women can be problematic. And it tends to be more problematic for women of color. But here's some good news. Now, this study, uh, excuse me, this New York Times headline came out in, on May 22nd. Um, they were letting us know that some employers now are beginning to see the benefit in supporting menopausal women. Um, so just to read some of these bullet points, employers are now realizing that offering help is a way to retain experienced women in the workforce because more evidence shows that menopausal symptoms, symptoms are hurting productivity and causing women, as we just said, to consider leaving their jobs. So there's this new movement to create menopause-friendly workplaces, and it began in Britain, where menopausal women are believed to be the fastest growing workforce demographic. So more than 50 British organizations, including the soccer club West Ham United, are now certified as being menopause friendly. They offer accommodations to these women. It can be anything from giving them a fan at their desk, modifying uniforms so that they're more comfortable, uh, modifying work hours to make them more flexible so that they can take time when symptoms dictate a need for it. Uh, it's estimated that three in 10 workplaces in Britain now have some type of menopausal policy in place. And this trend is beginning to catch on in the United States. New York City Mayor Eric Adams recently promised to change the stigma around menopause in the city and to create a more menopause-friendly workplace for our city workers. 
through improving policies and our buildings. So this is all fantastic news for women who have reached this point uh, in their hormonal uh, journey. So we often focus on symptom management with menopausal patients because that's what's bringing them into the door, right? That's why generally they come to see us. But I do want to remind you the importance of discussing how these hormonal changes can increase their risk of developing some pathologies. So we think about cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, dementia, including Alzheimer's, breast and endometrial cancer, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it's really important to discuss these disease prevention and risk reduction with these women. When we think about hormonal decline with menopause, most people are very comfortable with this idea that estrogen levels decline after the menopausal transition. You can see here, this is the decline in estrogen, a half to a third of the baseline levels. But progesterone really plummets up to a, a one to 120th of baseline levels. So that progesterone piece is often overlooked and that can be the cause of a variety of the symptoms that women experience. So because of that significant decrease in progesterone, we have to consider insufficient progesterone as also being potentially involved in all of these symptoms of menopause. Advance. Here we go. So um, this is a busy slide. I did want to include um, a bunch of these studies about vasomotor symptoms. So vasomotor symptoms is hot flashes slash night sweats, and these can just be debilitating for menopausal women. So I just wanted to show you some of this data. Long-term research shows that hot flashes continue on average for about five years after menopause, but up to a third of women can experience them for up to 10 years after menopause. A Swedish study of over 400,000 women found that 15% of women age 66 and 9% of women age 72 were still having hot flashes. A 2008 study in the United States found that 30% of women still had hot flashes up to 20 years after menopause, and so did 20% who were more than 20 years past menopause. A 2011 study of more than 8,000 Latin American women found that more than 60% were reporting these 12 years after menopause. A 2015 study from the U.S. found that women who began experiencing hot flashes before the menstrual period stopped found that they persisted as long as 12 years after menopause. Um, obese white women and black women, whether or not they were obese, were the most likely to have moderate to severe hot flashes. Non-obese white women had the lowest risk. Interestingly, women who had a high school education had a 34% lower risk of hot flashes. Studies also find that factors like previous hysterectomy, having been a smoker and drinking more alcohol can predict the women who had ever had a hot flash, uh, and moreover, anxiety, hysterectomy, depression, years since last menstrual period, and less education helped predict current uh, hot flash and night flash, uh, night sweats prevalence. So essentially, it's a big problem for a lot of women. There's a lot that we can do. Now, there is a new drug. It was uh, just approved uh, on May 12th for the management of moderate to severe hot flashes caused by menopause. So uh, Vioza um, is the trade name, Fezolinitant is the generic name. So this is an oral neurokinin-3 receptor antagonist. It's a non-hormonal treatment that works to block the activities of the NK3 receptor, which plays a role in the brain's regulation of body temperature. Um, so in the trial to approve it, it cut the frequency of hot flashes by an average of 7.5 per day by week 12. And this benefit was sustained during a 40-week extension phase, averaging about eight and a half fewer vasomotor symptoms every day. And the severity of the, the symptoms were also improved and they also these women also had better sleep. Um, Let's see here. So uh, of note, the, the treatment protocol was 45 milligram pill orally once a day with or without food, 
The pill should be taken at the same time each day. That was really important. If a dose is missed or not taken at the regular time, patients need to take it as soon as possible and return to their regular schedule the following day. So the timing is important, um, but do note this is pretty hard on the liver. Patients need to do blood work before they start uh, to get uh, baseline liver enzymes and then every three months for the first nine months of using the medication to see how it's gonna affect liver enzymes. But here is another strategy for managing hot flashes and night sweats. But generally what I like to do is look at hormone uh, balancing. So hot flashes are not just a symptom of estrogen deficiency. Um, or progesterone insufficiency, it can also often be fluctuating hormone levels. So this was salivary profiles that were taken every few minutes here. And you can see that the amount of hormone is really pulsatile. And this is what normally happens. These glands don't secrete us like a, like a water out of a hose type thing into our bodies. It's like a pulse. They pulse the hormones out over the course of the day. So if there's a lot of this, these women often have significant hot flashes and night sweats. So therapeutically, we can try to balance this out by using estrogen patches, which secrete a very consistent amount of uh, estrogen, you know, over the time that it's applied. Or if you're using creams, giving them twice a day, because that cuts down on the amounts of, you know, peaks and valleys that you'll have between applications. A quick note here about perimenopause and fertility. If your patients are heterosexual and they're sexually active, talk to them about continuing to use birth control. There is a decline in fertility in this time, but unplanned pregnancies are certainly possible until 12 consecutive months without a spontaneous menses or until FSH levels are consistently greater than 30. Um, you need to provide contraception for all of that time. And also, if you're giving them BHRT, make sure to use contraception, especially if you're giving them progesterone, because sometimes that can increase fertility and libido. Estrogen regulates adipose deposition. So during puberty, estrogen is responsible for the increase in the number of adipose cells that are deposited subcutaneously. Estrogen inhibits visceral abdominal fat in premenopausal women by decreasing lipogenesis in that specific area. But as estrogen levels decrease and there's less hormone to inhibit visceral fat, abdominal adipose cells increase in size and in quantity. And in, in some women, estrogen replacement has been shown to reverse this if they're deficient in estrogen and you replace it. However, I do want to emphasize that weight gain at midlife is mostly related to aging and lifestyle. It is not an issue of menopause or hormone therapy typically. Now, balancing hormones can certainly help and it can help women feel better and more able to exercise, but changes in body composition and fat distribution that are related to menopause are modest when we think about how to combat obesity. We know that menopause is associated with an increase in central abdominal obesity, as well as um, a decrease in lean body mass. But these women really have to exercise and they often have to change their diets if they want to lose weight. Um, sometimes it's controversial, but calories in and calories out is just sort of a good um, it's a it's an equation that's hard to argue with. So when women tell me I'm not losing weight, I feel like it's important to talk to them about what they're eating, when they're eating it, are they moving, how are they moving, are they tracking steps, are they tracking caloric intake? All of that is really important, and sometimes women have to really pay attention to that um, because we typically do start to gain weight as we age. Uh, and there's some metabolic things that push that and some horm hormonal changes that do. But to lose it, we got to get moving and we've got to make good choices with our food. <clears throat> some of the genitourinary syndromes and changes of menopause can be really um, debilitating. So what we're talking about here is a collection of signs and symptoms that are associated with estrogen deficiency that involve changes to the labia, the introitus, the vagina, the clitoris, the bladder, and the urethra. 
vulvovaginal atrophy is a component to the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It's a chronic and progressive condition, and the symptoms are unlikely to improve without treatment. So generally, the symptoms we're talking about are dryness, decreased lubrication during sex, discomfort or pain during sex, postcoital bleeding, decreased arousal and ability to orgasm, uh, irritation, burning, itching on the vulva or vagina, dysuria, and increased urinary frequency and urgency. The most bothersome symptoms uh, generally reported are vaginal dryness and dyspareunia, which can negatively affect sexual in intimacy and quality of life. So some treatment considerations here are vaginal suppositories if the symptoms seem to be more internal or vaginal creams if the issues seem to be more external. You can also consider testosterone and DHEA uh, creams um, for uh, these tissues um, and, and some ladies. And then of course, we're looking at the same diet and lifestyle considerations that we have uh, with women of all ages. We think about hot flashes and night sweats, neurotransmitters do play a role. They're associated with the declining estrogen levels. Declining estrogen levels have an impact on serotonin secretion and receptor sensitivity, and this can lead to changes in temperature regulation. So this might be part of the reason why um, this particular SSRI is now sold as a hot flash uh, management therapy. So this is a low dose SSRI that's now utilized uh, in some women with hot flashes. If you treat neuro, excuse me, if you test neurotransmitters and want to address those imbalances, generally you're going to look at amino acid therapies, nerving and adaptogenic herbs, and methylation and nutrient support. Um, and this document that tells you, uh, or doesn't tell you, but it gives you um, strategies for dealing with high and low values, uh, lives on our website. So some nutrients and botanicals that can help with the symptoms associated with peri and postmenopause are listed here. Um, so they're listed here by um, supplement. Um, each of these could, uh, you know, be the fodder for a lecture of their own. So I'm just going to briefly mention them here. They're evidence based, but then here these are um, sort of nutrients to consider by symptom. And these were all recommended to me um, by Tori Hudson, who's sort of known in some parts. She's a naturopathic doc who's really, really gifted in the use of botanicals for women's health. Uh, just wanted to pull out um, or give a shout out to maca root. Maca can be really helpful um, in all stages of um, a women's hormone journey, but in menopause, um, can be really helpful. It's a cruciferous root that grows in the Andes, but not all maca is the same. There are about 175 different species. A lot of the supplements out there contain Lepidium mayani, but Lepidium peruvianum has shown the best outcome for hot flashes. Uh, maca has been shown to slightly increase estrogen. This seems to be via adrenal gland support. Successful dosages are between two and three and a half grams per day for at least six weeks, but probably for longer. Um, also potential uh, abilities to treat libido, adrenal fatigue, hot flashes, night sweats, anxiety, and depression. Maca Go was the form used in this study. Exercise is really important in menopause. Like I said, generally we're looking at aerobic exercise and strength training exercise. It's helpful for symptom management as well as disease prevention in this cohort. Uh, so when would you consider hormone replacement? So when we think about hormone balancing, we're looking at um, all of the hormones. We wanna understand their interaction with one another, their downstream effects and metabolites and work to achieve a physiological balance. So we wanna relieve symptoms. We wanna prevent memory loss, protect cardiovascular health, bone health, some of those things that are, are associated with aging that we don't like, uh, prevent cancer and protect genitourinary health. So when you're talking to your patient, consider their priorities, their values, their fears and their concerns. This is the usual care model. Is the patient postmenopausal? No, give her a birth control pill. Did that resolve her symptoms? No, let's add an antidepressant. If she is menopausal, has she had a hysterectomy? Yes, give her Primarin. No, give her Primarin and Provera. 
surely we have more to offer our patients than conjugated equine estrogens, synthetic progestins, and antidepressants. Because there are potential risks to the conventional hormone replacement options that are out there. So looking to the Women's Health Initiative, which is you know, considered to be a hallmark, at least in starting to think about this, Women on Prim Pro, so that was the Primarin Plus, plus Provera, the, the CEE plus medroxyprogesterone acetate. They had a 41% higher incidence of stroke, twice the rate of blood clots, and a 26% increase in breast cancer. Now, keep in mind, heart disease is still the leading cause of death in postmenopausal American women. Again, Primpro is not bioidentical. It's oral, and the average age of participants in the Women Health, Women's Health Initiative was 63, meaning it had been quite some time between the menopausal transition and when they were given these hormones. A little more about or, oral synthetic HRT risk. There has been shown to be an increase in breast cancer, increase in gallbladder disease, especially in heavier women and an increased risk of endometrial hyperplasia and even cancer. But do keep in mind, a lot of these studies are looking at oral estrogens. Oral estrogen increases inflammation, transdermal estrogen will not. That is a big pearl for today. If we look at brain function, this study found that estradiol, but not Primarin, the conjugated equine estrogen to preserve brain function. The timing was important. Women who started estradiol within a year of menopause and stayed on it preserved brain activity, and when they stopped, brain function declined. However, staying on Primarin accelerated the brain's metabolic decline, and if the study participants also used a progestin, brain function declined even faster. For those who use a progestin with estradiol, it obliterated the benefits seen with bioidentical estradiol and brain function declined even faster than with Primarin alone. This is a big question. And so I wanted to share with you the position of the North American Menopause Society on progesterone and endometrial protection. So they state that women with an intact uterus using systemic estrogen therapy need to receive adequate systemic progestogens. And adequate progestogen combined with systemic estrogen meant that the risk of endometrial neoplasia was not higher than in untreated women. So the use of the word progestogen means that that encompasses both synthetic progestins and bioidentical progesterone. But you can use IUDs to prevent endometrial hyperplasia, or you can use, um, like I said, uh, oral progestins or oral progesterones. Um, and a note, if you're using estrogen and progesterone therapy and unscheduled bleeding occurs more than six months after initiation, she needs to be worked up, uh, meaning probably an ultrasound and potentially even an endometrial biopsy. So I do wanna say, that there have been some small studies that show endometrial protection with transdermal bioidentical progesterone. And I feel comfortable with this, but the conventional recommendation is that women with a uterus, oral progesterone is what's needed to protect the endometrium from cancer. There's a lot of research showing the dangers of oral progestins, the synthetic progestins. So an oral micronized progesterone might be a good option for this, whether it's compounded or the trademarked Prometrium. Um, and as we've said before, it's also an option to give transdermal progesterone while you're giving oral progesterone. <clears throat> Choosing to prescribe bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is not a one-size-fits-all model. Um, you can uh, tailor treatments to your individual's needs. So if a trademarked HRT option doesn't seem right for your patient, then talk to a compounding pharmacy in your area. Um, and you may also, you know, be helpful to remember that adrenals and thyroid also play a role in menopausal health. We're not really, don't have the time to talk about these today, um, but these can be um, gotten from any pharmacy. So the thing about compounding is um, you really only need to compound if there's some reason that the trademark version is not appropriate for your patient. But if there is a reason why it isn't, compounding pharmacies can also 
make up hydrocortisone and thyroid um, supplementation uh, things for you. Now, when it comes to transdermal dosages, this is generally where I start. Um, so I wanted to just provide this information for you. And then remember the general advice is to apply these hormones over thin skinned areas like the inner wrist and forearm or the backs of the knees or the tops of the feet. It's not recommended to apply it over fatty tissue. This is probably different from what your patients will read online, but the concept is because hormones are fat loving. And so if they're applied over adipose tissue, they're very content to just stay there in that tissue and absorption into the bloodstream is unpredictable. But if they're applied to thin skin, absorption is quick and the hormones are efficiently absorbed into the capillaries and then move to all the body tissues. Um, I do want to note though, if your patients are using transdermal patches, they should apply them over fatty tissue like the manufacturer says. <clears throat> the critical window hypothesis for hormone therapy. This states that the effect of hormone therapy depends on the timing of initiation with respect to age and or the menopausal transition and that optimal effects are evident with early initiation. Starting hormone therapy within 10 years of menopause or before age 60 has specific long-term protective effects. Um, this topic is somewhat controversial. I don't have time to go into it today, but I did wanna make sure you knew about the critical window hypothesis. So what it states is not only that these hormone therapies could be more beneficial if given within the critical window, in some cases they've shown that it could actually be harmful to cardiovascular disease, to the development of dementia, et cetera, if given outside of the critical window. There are nuances <clears throat> with the studies that have been looked at to confirm a critical window. A lot of them look at the oral conjugated equine estrogens plus progestin, oral estrogens, et cetera. I think that the type of estrogen used and the route of administration really matters. And so I think there's a lot of nuance here and it's not, I'm not completely sold on the idea of the critical window, but the take home is if you can educate your perimenopausal ladies, your newly menopausal ladies, about the benefits of beginning HRT sooner rather than later to protect their brains, their bones, their hearts, that's gonna be important because then you don't even have to have the conversation about being outside of the critical window. Okay, let's talk about testing quickly to review. Salivary hormone testing is really your best option if you're trying to establish baseline levels or if you're doing repeat testing to track any type of hormone therapy. Urinary hormone metabolite testing is the one you wanna use if you're interested in monitoring metabolism and movement out of the body. So if you wanna assess the risk factors associated with detox and excretion. Urinary neurotransmitters are always a great addition if you have symptoms associated with mood um, and some of the things in our bodies that could be associated with NT imbalance, like pain, for instance. And then always include that serum testing for a well-rounded assessment, those things that we discussed earlier. To monitor, remember, salivary testing is the only testing medium that can effectively monitor transdermal and sublingual hormone therapies. And really it's the best, in my opinion, for monitoring any type of therapy because it's giving us an insight into tissue levels. So if you've started a bioidentical or otherwise treatment protocol with your patients, you're gonna wanna retest salivary levels about two or three months after they've been using those ther uh, therapies consistently because you wanna check and see if the dosages that you've chosen are appropriate. Once the levels on testing and there's uh, look well-balanced and the symptoms seem well-balanced, you can move to annual testing after that, but recheck sooner if new symptoms uh, show up. With the HUMAP, you're gonna wanna retest after about three or six months, depending on the extent of the metabolic changes that you are trying to influence. All right, guys, thank you so much for sticking with me. I know that was a little bit longer than usual. It's just women's health is such an exciting and broad topic and we really only touched on um, the high points today, but thanks so much for your attention.